Now, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome along to DL St Andrews, and what a day, eh? what a spell we're having. We should be outside. Maybe we shouldn't. It's cooler in here. Nice in here anyway. What a fortnight Alice and Elaine have chosen for their holiday. I think they're camping in, in the Lake District, I think. I, I saw something. So they couldn't have chosen better. Eh, not too far away, not too far to, to travel. So thank you very much indeed for coming along for the second of the Tuesday eh, services during Alistair's absence. We come, of course, to worship God. And he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm footing. On my lips he put a new song, a song of praise to our God. We can't sing it, of course, <laughs> but hopefully it'll not be too long before we can indeed sing praises to our God. In the meantime, we'll listen to Great is Thy Faithfulness, our God. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thou compassions they fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Assurance, great is thy faithfulness. Let's come before our faithful God. Let's come before him in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and all loving God, we do bring to you our praise. We offer to you our worship. We would open to you our hearts. We would tell of all you mean to us. We would proclaim your name in a way that does justice to your greatness. God, hear our prayer. Eternal and all-powerful God, we hunger to meet with you, to hear your voice, 
to know your will, to learn more of you and to offer you a commitment that does justice to your love. God, hear our prayer. Gracious and all-forgiving God, help us then to acknowledge our faults, to confess our sins, to recognize our many weaknesses, to see all that is wrong in our lives, and to be a people who do justice to your mercy. God, hear our prayer. Great and all-transforming God, enable us to serve you more faithfully, love you more deeply, know you more fully, obey you more completely, and live in a way that does justice to your renewing power. God, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, you know where we are, and you know where we want to be. Please hear our prayer, receive our worship, and so help us to become the people you would have us to be. To the glory of your name. Amen. And a couple of Bible readings this afternoon. Right at the start of the Bible in Genesis, first chapter, a few verses from Genesis 1, verses 26 to 31. Let's hear God's word. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has, been, that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening. And there was morning. The sixth day. And then a few verses from Paul's letter to the church of Galatia from Galatians chapter 5. Reading from verse 13. Just 10 verses there. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping with this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh deserves what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen. May God bless to us 
these readings from his word. Let's listen again as we hear, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. God sent his son, they call him Jesus. of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Saviour and our Redeemer. Amen. I think most of you will know that um, over all my years I've been particularly fond of poetry and I've dined exceptionally well, as you can see, on haggis, neeps and tatties and burn suppers. Believe it or not, there are a few more in the diary for next year. Which is just wonderful. I mean, do you think the haggis are, have had an easy time of it? They haven't been shot much last year or so, so there should be plentiful plates come next spring. In addition to that, I spent many years going around giving talks on 
poetry, some of my favourite poems, usual fun. I stopped that a few years ago, but it was great fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and one of the ten or a dozen talks I had was about poems of childhood. And I, I prefaced it, when I stood up to speak a particular one of my poems, I always said, I, I know you'll all be surprised to know that I'm a grandpa. And invariably the response came back, no. The odd one said, have you looked in the mirror this last while? You've got to be tough when you're treading the boards in, these, in this west of Scotland. So we laugh about that. Become a grandpa. But I have put an end to these talks for a while, so I'll see if the, anything's changed. So have I said to you today, I know you'll all be very surprised that I'm a great grandpa. Eh? <laughs> That's enough. That's the end of the service of that. Things have not changed, have they? Well, I have. I am now a great grandpa, and I chose deliberately how sweet to hold a newborn baby. So there's me, Anne. I'm sorry about the pictures, but the pictures, Anne, is of me with kicking out and on my chest fast asleep is young Adrian, who's now 11 months old. That's taken two or three months ago. That's him when he's not sleeping. And there's a puzzle about that wee one. Because I'm this size, still just about six foot. Doreen comes to my shoulder. Look at the size of Adrian there. Every week we get that for a, maybe three hours, and we're knackered. Am I allowed to say knackered? All right. We're done in. Okay. We're very tired. After three hours, because he's now at the stage of crawling and beginning to stand up, and we feel our age big time. But it is still sweet to hold that newborn baby. But when a baby's born, there's a, a series. If I come home and say to Doreen, oh, I heard so-and-so's had the baby, there's always a few quick questions. Do you know what they are? What, is it a boy or a girl? What's the weight? Well done. I thought it was just me. What's the weight? Name? Well done, yeah. Anything else? Oh, the colour, right? The colour, hair colour, yeah, it's dark, red. Right, yeah, well done, yeah. This is a great list. But there's one other one. You all right? Yep, yeah, you're done. Who does he look like? Or who does she look like? Am I right? That's always on the list of questions I get. And when I respond and say, it's a baby for goodness sake, I get a scowl. Must look like one or other. So where did it all start? Well, we read about it in our Bible today. It all started with the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, we read that wee bit that said, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the, and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And later on in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, we read, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So what does this mean, being made in God's image? Are we all alike? Dare we say we look like God? Of course we can't say that. That was reinforced to me just a few years ago when with some friends here, several who are here today, we went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land and one of our visits was to the town of Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And in Nazareth there's a huge church, the Church of the Annunciation. This is the church commemorating where Mary met the angel who told her she had been chosen to bear Jesus, the Son of God. And in this huge church, there's two levels. The lower level is the original church. When they decided it was growing, that they were going to build a new church, what did they do? They built on top of it. 
straight into a brilliant piece of architecture and a very, very stunning church indeed now. On the lower level, there's a small grotto denoting the place where Mary is said to have met with the angel. Some seating just around there enclosed. But climb the stairs either side to a spectacular upper level added later on, built on top of that base, an amazing piece of architecture and a wonderful place of worship. And this upper level has afforded the opportunity for Christians all around the world, through all different countries, to add some tapestries, some paintings, some tapestries all around the walls on the upper floor level. The tapestries are all different sizes. Some of them are huge, huge Others are much smaller, all depicting Mary with her child, usually in her arms. What a great variety there is. <clears throat> the United Kingdom has one very traditional one. The USA has got a stunning one, a con kind of contemporary abstract one. Italy, Canada, we went all round the walls. Then I noticed one that took my breath away, and I'll ask Colin to put up this slide. And I hope you can see that. But what this slide is, is a Japanese Mary and a Japanese Jesus. Looking round about, I saw an African Mary, an African Jesus. All round the walls of this Church of the Annunciation, there are tapestries denoting the mother and child representing all round the world. I look back to my Sunday school days and I remember the little song, Jesus, I'm not allowed to sing it. Jesus loved the little children and all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, and they are called to say my child. Jesus loved the little children. Don't tell Alistair, all right? That'll be me drummed out again. I remember that reading in Genesis that we read. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Our mighty God is God of all nations in the world, not just our Western society. Of course he isn't. So the question then, is he a multicolored God? Part white, part yellow, part red, part? Of course not. We've no idea, and I for one don't care. I do know this that he is God of the whole universe and Father to the whole earth. Yes, and all the other planets too. So what can it Bible, that Bible mean when it says so often they were made in God's image? They are not to look like him. They are not to be the Japanese, follow the Japanese custom, or African, we are just to worship God. But we all are asked in the Bible to become like Jesus. We strive to be like our Lord. And there's the answer. So although no one knows what God looks like, our New Testament leads us to look no further than Jesus. If we wish to know what God is like, look to Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, we read, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, there is, this, not, this is not a suggestion, of course, of physical imagery. It must, yes, must be a pointer to all of us. Wherever we live, in Scotland, in the UK, in the world, to shape our lives and our actions as best we are able by following the example given to us by that Savior, by that Son of God, Jesus, when he lived for such a short time with us. A wonderful and helpful translation of the Bible is the message by Eugene Peterson. And I read that same wee verse from Genesis to see what Peterson interpreted that as. And he writes, God spoke, let us make human beings <coughs> in our image, make them reflecting our nature. What an important point. Note that, please. Make them reflecting our nature. Not what we look like, but what we do. There's no shortage of guidance in our Bible as to how we can do so in striving to follow the Master. 
how we can live in a way which reflects the nature of God, following the example of Jesus' his Son. In John chapter 15, Jesus says that he's the vine and we're the branches. He's pointing out so clearly that we cannot be attached as branches to the Lord and not be influenced by his life and his words and his works. John 14, chapter 12, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. So what can we do to honor that invitation to work for our Lord and strive to reflect his nature? How can we strive to live in the image of God? Colin, my last slide, please. In Paul's letter to the church at Galatia in chapter 5, verse 22, which we read, it's spelt out when we are advised what the fruits of the Spirit are. And what a challenge is there we are driven to show in our works, in our daily lives, as Jesus did, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wow! Who can possibly claim that in our daily lives we always demonstrate to others that list, showing these nine attributes it's verging on the impossible, but maybe not quite. I was thinking about this and took a minute to think on who I regard, and you can do the same, as faithful followers of Jesus. No matter the challenges, no matter the storms of life, no matter they are able to radiate the Christian way of living. I can say for sure and certain that I know and have known some who over the years I would regard as coming pretty close to matching up in their lifestyle to the demanding lists of the fruits of the Spirit and constantly serving the Lord in their way of life. So is it tough to do so? Well, yes, of course it is. It can be particularly so in the modern age when the church would appear to be being forgotten by so many. But we have the wonderful reassurance in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when things get tough, just, just remember Jesus' words. We are not alone. The Lord says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and burden, my burdens are light. The support of Jesus through the Holy Spirit is always, always with us. We do, of course, have different skills. What should we be doing to serve the Lord? The answer is following the works and examples which are also spelt out in the Bible, perhaps in Romans 12. Love in action, it says, listing the guide to the skills which we can bring to our service of the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, the message translation further qualifies and expands on that fruit of the Spirit and reads, So chosen by God for this new life of love, dressed in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. So you and I can strive to do that in whatever line of work or leisure our life leads us. And you know what? I believe that's exactly what our Bible means when it says that we are in the image of God. I believe that striving to attain as best we can these standards will put us on the path to being able to say that our love of Jesus, as demonstrated by our life, by our actions, gives us the confidence to claim that we are indeed steadfast followers of him now and forever, striving to be like his image and encouraging others to come and follow him too. The word image crops up one more time. One of the most famous and 
loved passages in their Bible. First Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's masterpiece letter on love, and what a wonderful reassurance for all who love the Lord and strive to live in his image. My liking for the message translation falls down a bit here, but it says we don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long till the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But a great-grandpa who's followed Jesus can read and say from an old translation, what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What a wonderful hope and promise for the days ahead. So for now, let's strive to work in the image of God, guided by our Bible and following the wonderful example of his son, Jesus, our Savior. I was reading a li an edition of Life and Work recently and it very, rector, very reverend Dr. John Chalmers finished a section on nurturing faith. And I like this. Let me share in conclusion what Chalmers writes. He says, Paul reminds us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with that spirit. It may indeed be a wee bit of a victor meldrew in all of us, but those traits of irritation, impatience, and intolerance are not the fruit of the spirit. What singles out the great saints of the past, Francis of Assisi, Teresa of Avila, Ignatius of Loyola, and the great servants of the present, is that when people ask, who do they take after? The answer is the carpenter of Nazareth. And under their nurturing influence, people find faith. May we strive to nurture and influence others. And we pray that they are drawn to live in the image of God. To his name alone all of the glory and all of the praise now and forevermore. Amen. Let's come together as we pray again. Living God, we thank you for our world full of so many wonderful sounds, the sound of children laughing, Babies crying, people talking, sound of birds singing, perhaps an orchestra playing, the sound of wind blowing in the trees and waves crashing on the seashore, the sound of everyday life in a busy street, and also the sound of silence. Lord of all, teach us to listen. In all kinds of ways you speak to us but so often we fail to listen to what you're saying. We come to you in prayer, but we do not wait to hear your answer. We give ear to a multitude of voices clamoring for attention, but we do not hear the still, small voice within. Lord of all, teach us to listen for that still, small voice. Forgive us that we close our minds to what we don't want to hear, or that we're sometimes too busy to hear, or that we hear only with our ears and not with our soul. Lord of all, teach us to listen with our souls. Living God, we thank you. We thank you for speaking to us each and every day. So teach us to listen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We come near the end, and just before we close, let me say thank you to Colin, to Jeanette, Alistair, Martin, and also to 
all the ladies who are waiting to serve you with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Maybe iced coffee today, is it? I don't know. I think they've got cold drinks as well, I was assured. But you're all welcome through in the hall for a wee while for a chat. We've now got some nice benches outside if you wish to sit outside too. On the way out, on the table at the side here, I get the opportunity to see it here. You'll be able to pick up, if you wish one, a CD. Walk down hymns. Eric and Colin have collaborated and pieced together a wee free CD. There's a bundle of them on the table, just where the hand sanitizers are. Some of the hymns through lockdown. Well worth a listen. Also, I'm indebted to our dear friend Christine, Christine Scott, who over many months of lockdown in little alcove outside here has left a wee wayside pulpit, a message which has changed faithfully so regularly. And there's a brand new one. So what the, now the idea was to, people would help themselves to the cards that were there. And of course, there was the danger that would cause some congestion, congestion on the way out the door. But it doesn't take a second to grab a card. And I've sneaked another bundle onto the table as well, beside the CD. So thank you, Christine, for that and for keeping it going all the way through lockdown. Maybe we'll need to make you redundant someday, will we? I don't think so. I don't think so. You've worked to do for the Lord. So thank you for that and the invitation to come back this Sunday. Is Ian, are you preaching on Sunday? Ian's here on Sunday. It was nice to see Rob back with us um, last Sunday and to see how well he looked. So we look forward to Ian's message with us on Sunday and we'll close. We'll close with I, the Lord of Sea and Sky.
let us now go forward, striving to bring honor to God by working steadfastly to live our lives in his image, as demonstrated to us by the life of Jesus and the guidance of his Bible. To Jesus alone, to God alone, be all of the praise and all of the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.